Today's message, Apollos. How many have already learned a few things about Apollos this morning? Great, we have lots more. Reading from Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 28. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sencrea because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with him, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Last week, we looked at Paul planting the church in Corinth. We have been following his second missionary journey from Philippi to Thessalonica, down to Berea, Athens, and to Corinth. And his pattern has been to go to the Jewish synagogue when he arrives uh, to a new city, and he argues from the Old Testament scripture that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and that this Messiah is Jesus. Now, although Paul had been very successful at planting churches, he has also garnered a lot of persecution from some of the Jews who have become jealous of him. As you recall, these Jews had started riots to drive Paul out of their cities and even have him put in jail. And this tension between the Jews who believe in Jesus and those who didn't had not been isolated only to Paul's ministry. While in Corinth, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. Remember from last week, we introduced Priscilla and Aquila. These were well-off Christian Jews who were living in Rome and yet were exiled along with the other Jews in Rome by the emperor Claudius. They had made their way to Corinth where they met Paul and formed a deep and lasting friendship. Remember we talked about that last week. Now aside from Paul, there were many Christian evangelists and missionaries spreading out into the known world some of which had reached Rome and established a growing and vibrant church, of which Aquila and Priscilla were a part of. And the tension between the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews in Rome grew so intense that the emperor, who was not able to distinguish between Christian Jews and non-Christian Jews, he expels all the Jews from Rome. Hmm. We have seen such riotous reaction to the message of Jesus as we have followed Paul from city to city, right? So we see this happening beyond Paul in other cities in the Roman Empire. And although the Jews attempted to do the same thing to Paul in Corinth to drive him out, the proconsul of Corinth, Gallio, puts them back in their place and he quells the riot, all of which we looked at last week. And it is here that we pick up our story today. Paul had already been in Corinth for a year and a half 
when Gallio had quelled the uprising. And we read that Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, likely enjoying the freedom to continue ministry, having the Roman authorities putting these jealous Jews back in their place. But then Paul decides it's time to move on. Paul wants to make it to Jerusalem for the Passover, where he is eager to give a report to the church. He wants to tell the Jerusalem church of the Gentile church, the non-Jewish church, how it is one with the Jerusalem church and that it is not broken free from them. You see, the spirit of unity was very important to Paul as he arranged for a large financial gift to be brought to the Jerusalem church from the Gentile churches. And we spoke about this when Paul went to Berea. It was Sopater of Berea who would later bring this financial gift to Jerusalem with Paul. So Paul leaves for Jerusalem from Corinth. So first he goes to Sencrea, which is a port on the east side of the Isthmus of Corinth. And he shaves his head, as is the custom of finishing a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow. Now, although to complete a Nazarite vow properly, one has to be in the promised land, right? But many of the Jews didn't live in the promised land. <laughs> so they would make variations of such a practice. It is likely that Paul had made a private vow modeled after a Nazarite vow, the fulfillment of which was an act of thanksgiving for protecting him in Corinth. Remember we looked at that last week? The Lord said, stay in Corinth. Paul keeps speaking, I will protect you. So probably in thanks to God, he made a vow. And now he's at the end of his vow. They usually do it for a period of about 30 days. And then at the end of their vow, they cut their hair. So that's probably what Paul did there. Now, Paul, he leaves from Corinth and goes to Sencrea. And he spent some time in Sencrea. Right? Notice how we, we looked at last week with Luke. He just mentions one little thing there. But the truth is he stays for a long time. Like he stays in these places for two years, etc. Well, he probably spent quite a bit of time in Sencrea because it is believed that he established a local church there. Who, what famous, what famous woman in the New Testament comes from Sencrea? Anybody? Priscilla? No. She is a famous woman in the New Testament, though. Phoebe. Phoebe the deaconess. Phoebe the deaconess was from Sencrea, and she was actually entrusted with Paul's letter to the Romans, and Paul recommended, commends her to them as she brings that letter. So Phoebe is from Sencrea, and this is likely where they meet and develop a friendship. Interesting note here about women in ministry. Did you notice when we read our passage in Acts that Luke had switched from putting Aquila's name first to putting Priscilla's name first. Did you notice that? Hmm, fancy schmancy. Was that just an arbitrary thing that he did? Right. <laughs> when Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth, Luke puts Aquila's name first. Right? So Aquila is, is a male and Priscilla is a female, just so you know, just so we aren't confused there. But then, hereafter, Luke puts Priscilla's name first and then Aquila's. And then every time Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned in the book of Acts after this, and in the letters of Paul, Priscilla's name comes first. As was the custom, the prominent teacher's name was always put first. Priscilla was known to be the prominent teacher of the two. There is no shying away of recognizing women in leadership in the early church. And this should be our example today, that when it comes to leadership and teaching in the church, men and women are equal. Some are better than others. I know you've mentioned Sasha is quite the good teacher around here, and we'll just leave it there. <laughs> so Priscilla and Aquila, they leave Corinth with Paul. They travel with him to Sencrea and then on to Ephesus. I think we have a map here of the travels. There we are. So 
We've been following along, along here, remember the Via Ignata, the military road that runs across the top of Greek, Greece here. So Philippi is around here. So Paul goes down to, from Philippi to Thessalonica. Then there's a ride of the Jews. He goes down here to Berea. Then from Berea, he goes all the way down to Athens, which is over here. After Athens, he lands in Corinth. He's in Corinth for approximately two years. And then from Corinth, he goes over to Sencrea, which is right over here, actually, on this port. And then from there, he sails over to Ephesus, right over here. Then he brings Priscilla and Aquila with him. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, they leave Corinth with Paul, and they stay in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a very prosperous commercial city on the main trade route from Rome to Babylon and the Euphrates River. It was the seat of administration for Rome and the province of Asia. It was a free Greek city. It had its own senate, and it had its own civic assembly. There was also a very large settlement of Jews, which were given special privileges by the Roman Empire in 44 BC. And perhaps this is why Priscilla and Aquila decide to stay in Ephesus and to settle down there for a number of years, like seven to ten years they stay in Ephesus, while Paul moves on to Jerusalem. Now, when Priscilla, Aquila, Paul, when they arrive in Ephesus, what does Paul do? How do you know? <laughs> yes, he goes to the synagogue. Well, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't Paul say that he would no longer go to the Jews? Right. In Corinth, he gets fed up with them. And he says, I, I'm just exasperated with you people. I'm done with you Jews. Your response in Philippi and Thessalonica, now in Corinth, I'm done. He was just frustrated, feeling a little burnt out. But he renews his strength, and he goes to the synagogue in Ephesus. You see, we tend to give up every once in a while too, right? That's okay. It's okay to feel exasperated. It's, it's okay to want to give up sometimes. Even Paul himself became frustrated and gave up on people at times. It would have been frustrating for him. Think about it, arguing for hours, for days, showing them in the Scripture that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again. It was right there. And Paul had a very special gift for expounding the Scriptures. His knowledge and the study of the Old Testament Scriptures made him especially effective when evangelizing to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And little did he know, God was raising up another with this exact same ability as Paul, Apollos, who meets Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, but missing Paul, who had moved on in haste to Jerusalem to make it in time for the Passover. Paul makes a very positive impact in Ephesus at the synagogue while he is there. They ask him to stay. They, they want to learn more, but Paul has a mission to complete in Jerusalem. He does not, he, so he makes the promise to come back. He says, if God wills, in verse 21, I'll come back. Well, this is Luke's way of foreshadowing Paul's return to Ephesus, which he does in chapter 19. And we know that when he comes back to, to Ephesus, he stays a long time. How long do you think he stays in Ephesus when he comes back? Four years, close, at least three years. Yeah, so between three and four years. There were already Christians in Ephesus when Paul arrived, but the Jews at the synagogue hadn't had anyone to expound the Old Testament scriptures like Paul, and they wanted to hear more. And before Paul returns to Ephesus for his extended stay, he sails from Ephesus down to the seaport of Caesarea close to Jerusalem. Then, after Jerusalem, he goes there for the Passover feast, he goes back to Antioch, his home base, from where he launches into all of his missionary journeys. And Luke mentions very briefly, in verses 22 and 23, Paul's journey to Jerusalem, Antioch, his circuit into Galatia, and Phrygia. And again, Luke is writing a synopsis of what happened and only includes the details he feels are important. Can we put that map back up there for a second? The map of, uh, there we are. All right, 
So, Paul, he's in, he's in Ephesus, right, just for a very short time. He leaves Priscilla and Aquila there, and he leaves, and he goes all the way down, takes a boat, and he sails to Caesarea, seaport. From Caesarea, he goes up to Jerusalem for the Passover. From Jerusalem, he goes up to Antioch. And then from Antioch, he stays there for a while, it says, right? He stayed there for a while. Then from Antioch, he goes into the province of Galatia and Phrygia, up here. And he tours all of those churches in his first missionary journey, and he goes and visits them all to encourage them, to, to teach them, to help them. He goes to uh, Derby and Lystra, Iconium, Pisidian, all these cities in this area. How many miles do you think he traveled there? 1,500 miles! <laughs> 1,500 miles! Yet in Luke, in those two verses, it says, you know, well, Paul went to Caesarea, Jerusalem, and up to Antioch, and then he went to Galatian Phrygia, <laughs> right? Like, we miss all those details. He was gone a very long time. And it was during this time that Apollos arrives in Ephesus. Who was this Apollos? Where did he come from? What was he doing he was having a tremendously positive impact wherever he went, so much that he was considered an equal with Peter and Paul. Did you know that? He had earned such a reputation as a teacher that he was considered equal to Peter and to Paul. Paul says in one of his letters to the Corinthians, he says, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Right? In 1 Corinthians. Remember that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He's saying to the Corinthians, you're arguing amongst each other. One says, well, I follow Paul. Oh, yeah, well, I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. I follow Cephas. Right? We know Peter. We know Paul. But who is this Apollos? Luke tells us that he is a native of Alexandria. You know where Alexandria is? Hate to, hate to do this to you again, Trish. Can we put the map back up just for a second? That was my fault. I didn't arrange the slides uh, very well for her this morning. Uh, if we can go back, back the other way. Uh, no, backwards. Um, okay. <laughs> she knows where it is. There it is. So this is where, down at the bottom of the map here, Alexandria, that's where Apollos, the Jew, grew up. Very interesting, isn't it? He is a native of Alexandria. Alexandria in Egypt. It was the most prominent center of learning for philosophy, for rhetoric, of scholarly pursuits. It was renowned throughout the Roman Empire. Apollos was also a Jew, right? <clears throat> I'm sure that's easy to guess with a good Jewish name like Apollos. <laughs> Very uh, internationally minded Jewish family, <laughs> right? But he was Jewish. He grew up Jewish. He would have learned the Old Testament scriptures in great detail as a child growing up. He was gifted. His parents would have recognized his intellect at an early age, and they set him on a path of scholarly pursuits. Just the kind of career growing up in Alexandria lent itself to. He had the greatest resources at his fingertips. Apollos he would have studied under the famous Jewish philosopher of Alexandria, Philo. So he was deeply studied in Old Testament scripture, in philosophy and rhetoric. Apollos was a rhetorician. Do you remember from last week what a rhetorician is? As you know, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> a rhetorician is an expert in formal rhetoric a speaker whose words are primarily intended to impress or persuade. It's no wonder that Apollos was so effective. He was educated, very well-spoken, and charismatic. Many people think it was Apollos who wrote the book of Hebrews, although the theory is not conclusive. So while Paul is on his church circuit, through the provinces of Galatian Phrygia, Apollos arrives in Ephesus and meets Priscilla and Aquila. How surprised Priscilla and Aquila must have been to show up at synagogue one Saturday and find Apollos expounding the scriptures just like 
Paul. Wow, that's amazing. It was back in Corinth when they went to the synagogue and they heard Paul doing the exact same thing. And then they go to Ephesus. There's another one. <laughs> this is amazing. Here's another Christian missionary arriving in Ephesus, just as educated in the Old Testament scriptures as Paul. He spoke boldly. He had confidence. He was convinced Jesus was the Messiah. And just like Paul could show in the scriptures that the Messiah had to suffer and die and rise again. So Priscilla and Aquila, they invite him back to their home. They miss their dear friend Paul, and they saw so much of him in Apollos. They had seen how effective Paul was by going to the synagogues. They had also learned so much from Paul about Jesus and the moving of the Holy Spirit. And as they get to know Apollos, they realize he still has much to learn about the Christian life. The Christian church was growing so fast that not everyone was on the same page. Some had more knowledge than others. Some had different knowledge than others. And Apollos, he hadn't heard of the baptism of Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had only been baptized in water, known as believer's baptism, or the baptism of John. Apollos, he recognized the purpose of water baptism, and when he becomes a Christian, he gets water baptized. Theodore Ferris in the Interpreter's Bible Commentary outlines the purpose of water baptism very well. And we have his quote here as well. He says, um, you have that one there, Trish, the Theodore Ferris quote on baptism? Uh, one more. Oh, one more. And one more after that. There we are. Theodore Ferris. He says about baptism. Baptism was a dying to self. It was a recognition that of your own self you can do nothing, claiming nothing, only counting on God's love and forgiveness. This is what Apollos understood. Yet, Apollos gains much more experience and knowledge from Priscilla and Aquila. While in Ephesus, he also meets people from Corinth, and he hears about the church there. Just west of Corinth is Achaia, and then Apollos catches a vision of doing missionary work in Achaia. The believers in Ephesus, they write a letter of recommendation for him so he will be well received in Corinth and from where he will launch his missionary journey into Achaia. So Apollos leaves Ephesus. Priscilla and Nicola, they pray for him. He receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then he goes to Corinth where he sets up his base, and then he does missionary work into Achaia. And then Priscilla and Aquila, they hear of his great success in Corinth and throughout Achaia. Hmm. We hear that he's vigorously debating with the Jews in public that Jesus is the Messiah. And then Luke says in verse 27 that Apollos was a great help to those who by grace had believed. That Apollos was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Well, what was the message that Apollos was spreading? What was this message Paul and the missionaries and the evangelists of the early church were teaching. What did they believe? You see, the Christian message is different. This wasn't a renewed moral or ethical encouragement to a world that had lost its way. The message wasn't just be a good person. They didn't believe in just being good people. So what did they believe? What was the Christian message? It's that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. It was not the law of the Old Testament that saves us, but the Messiah of the Scriptures. And that Messiah is Jesus. It's not by trying to be a good person that we connect with God, but by faith in Him. Theodore Ferris again points out, that the Christian message changed the center of things from self-directed effort 
to God-given grace. That the Christian message changed from the center of things of self-directed effort to God-given grace. And this is why Luke says in verse 27, those who by grace believed. Grace is not a natural human disposition. Even Apollos had to be instructed in the way more accurately by Priscilla and Aquila. And although his knowledge of Scripture was vast, the ways of the Spirit and a reminder of grace needed to be bestowed on him to increase his effectiveness. Even Paul had to revisit those churches. Even Paul had to write letters to bring them back to the core of the Christian message that we don't please God by being good people, but by grace we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to be continually brought back from trying to be a good person to the Christian message of grace, a place of faith where we freely receive the salvation, the love, and the life of God in our lives. We make the same mistakes that they did back then, don't we? It's so easy to do. This is a continual process in our lives, one that needs constant encouragement, one that needs a Christian community that is focused on faith and grace and love. Today, just as in the days of Paul, there are Christian communities that have fallen from grace and become focused on pleasing God with their lifestyle. And they have it backwards. We don't earn God's favor by being good people. We submit to Him in faith, and as a result, He changes us. So we need to ask ourselves, have we strayed from the Christian message? that call to faith. We need the Priscilla and Aquilas, Apollos and Pauls, to explain that way more accurately to us, to bring us back to the essential message of Christianity that was turning the world upside down back then. There are churches today that are filled with people who say they are Christians, who know the gospel and are good people, but have missed the true message and calling of Jesus on our lives. Our understanding of what a Christian is today is less accurate. And the meaning of what it means to be a Christian needs to be revisited and revitalized. The, message, the messaging today is less accurate. It says, be a good person. It says, pursue your dreams. It says, be happy. Find contentment. Treat one another well. Be the best you can be. Oh, these are all good things. But that is not the Christian message. Theodore Ferris, again in the interpreter's commentary, he says it very well. He points out, the churches are filled with people who are Christians, but not quite. They know the gospel. They try to live a good Christian life. They have a high sense of moral responsibility. They assume their part in the life of the community. But they have missed what the way of God really means. They have given up the direction they have never given up the direction of their own lives. They have never stood in the presence of the mighty God and admitted that of themselves they could do nothing. This is no merely academic distinction. It is the distinction between the religion of being a good person and the religion of faith. To obey the commandments of Jesus to practice the principles set forth in the Sermon on the Mount is a moral goal to which all Christians aspire. But if a person has nothing more than a moral goal to strive for, they have missed the meaning of Christianity. 
I'm going to say that line again. If a person has nothing more than a moral goal to strive for, they have missed the meaning of Christianity. The church was not, is not, and never can be a society for the improvement of morals. It was at the start, is now, and always must remain a resurrection center in which men and women see the reality of God, surrender the direction of their lives, die to their own selfish wills, and are raised to a new and different life. What all conscious striving of our moral effort fails miserably to do. You see, the message of Christianity is that God has done something for us. If we are trying to live the life Jesus has called us to do, we will never achieve it. The Christian message is not a call to achieve a moral life. It is to surrender to God, to recognize our dependence on Him, and by faith invite Him to do a work in our lives. So may we be those who by grace have believed and be of great help to one another, just like Apollos. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your message truly is different. Paul understood it, and Peter understood it, and Apollos he was instructed more accurately, and he came to understand it as well. God, you have not called us to a higher moral standard. You've called us to know you. You've called us to be connected to you. You've called us to surrender to you. So, Lord, we do. We, we surrender. Help us to surrender. We invite you into our lives, Jesus. We recognize that we need you. And Lord, next week as we celebrate Emily's baptism, that recognition of our dependence on God, may we all in our hearts be in the same place that you have called us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.